you have a round for uh, helping us create this national audience it's really important. Thank you. Um, so uh, I just wanted to say that this is a really important panel, this is really important work going on in the Twin Cities. Um, and in the Twin Cities, uh, and I'm going to allow uh, people here to talk about it uh, themselves, uh, but just want to say that there are two um, uh, initiatives here in the Twin Cities that are kind of joined together. One is the Twin Cities Theatres of Color Coalition, who came together to talk about equity in our theatres. This is five theatres led by leaders of color. We have four of those theatres here. We have a couple of guests who are we're expecting right now. They'll join us as we go along. And so we have four of those theatres here um, to talk about that. Um, and, and so these theatres are Theatre Mo, uh, with Randy Ray sitting next to me, um, uh, Fedjia, the Punker, our new native theatre, Riana Yazzi, who will be here very soon, uh, and Justiniano from Teatro del Pueblo, who will also be here. And the person who's missing is Sarah Bellamy, who is from Penumbra. And, uh, and we also have, uh, our, uh, and, and then along with them, we have some guests from our foundations here who created a really revolutionary uh, organization or um, initiative called the Racial Equity Funding Collaborative. And they're here to talk about uh, funding and how that's, so how the climate is shifting in the Twin Cities. So we have folks from um, the Bush Foundation, uh, from the Minister of Community Partners, the Lip Knight Foundation, and also from the Jerome Foundation. So we'll be talking to all of them and, uh, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves. So we'll start with the TikTok folks and then as folks come along, we'll have them introduce themselves as well. So maybe just a little bit, just one sentence about yourself and the organization you're from. Hi, thank you for having me here. It's a really special institute. Um, my name is Randy Reyes and I'm the artistic director of Theatre Move. Um, we produce great performances from the heart of the Asian American experience. Um, we've been around for 26 years, uh, and I've been artistic director for five of those years. Um, and um, I'm very excited to be a theater of color Asian Pacific Island American company in the Twin Cities. And we've produced, with a show that we're producing um, right now, we open next week for previews, will be our 54th world premiere. Uh, in Hi, my name is Kristen Marks. I work at the McKnight Foundation, and the sentence about the organization I work for um, is that McKnight is dedicated to improving the quality of life for present and future generations. And then specifically the arts team for which I work uh, with and serve on, um, we support working artists in the state of Minnesota. And we believe that um, when artists thrive, when artists thrive, Minnesota thrives. Hi everyone, I'm Eleanor Savage. I'm an uh, artist and activist. I work uh, in philanthropy for the Jerome Foundation and the program director. Been there for 11 years. Jerome Foundation has been around for 54 years and supports early career artists uh, in Minnesota and New York City, uh, and also arts organizations that support early career artists. Hi everyone, um, I'm Takara Henniger, and I am an associate program officer at the St. Paul Minnesota Community Foundation. Um, and the way that I look at it is that it's a community foundation and then there's also um, a private foundation and a family foundation and then we say about 2,000 other partners and it's donor funds, um, donor advice funds and other types of funds that are at the foundation that we fund in this Hello everyone, my name is Justin Christine, I'm at the Bush Foundation based in St. Paul. Uh, thank you for allowing me to share this space with you all today. Uh, the Bush Foundation is a private foundation uh, focusing on North Dakota, South Dakota, Minnesota, and the 23 native nations that share that geography. Uh, I work on our community creativity strategy, which is making art and culture essential to problem solving across systems, across communities, across issue areas. My passion in the world is that um, how art and culture connect um, across systems, across cultures. I've always been fascinated by that. So I get to bring that passion, that interest into my work every day. Thank you. 
I um, debunk her. Around a table to talk about the work. 
um, and each one of us came from our own experience, lived experiences. You know, these are not theoretical, uh, out there, somewhere else, somebody's experiencing. This is our lived experiences for years, and, and our elders who have gone through this. And so suddenly, there was a huge sense of uh, strength and uh, feeling of empowerment we all felt. When uh, I had the honor of becoming artistic director at Theater Move, uh, that fall, um, there was a, a predominantly white organization um, that was producing Miss Saigon. So I stepped into that great opportunity. As I <laughs> <laughs> right? uh, time things are opportunities. Um, and uh, in dealing with that, we heard a lot from the uh, Southeast Asian community um, in the Twin Cities. And this was the fourth production that had come to the Twin Cities. And the previous three had come with protests from the community. And they were the same organization, by the way, the same organization, their fourth time. Um, and uh, so I, I took, got a lot of counsel from a lot of people, and, we, and Theater Wu decided just to create conversations. So. We weren't directly protesting or doing anything like that. We were just creating space for a conversation to happen. And one of the last conversations, so we had one with just the Asian American um, activist artist, and then we had one with the theater community, then we had one with everybody. And that last one was at NPR. NPR. And, uh, and, and in that last one, Rihanna and Sarah, along with Vicki Benson, and Sharon, I think, was also there. Ricky Benson from the McKnight Foundation, Sarah from Penumbra, and Penumbra is an African-American company that's been around for 42 years, um, and, uh, and Rihanna from New Native. And um, that feeling of, of solidarity from other communities meant so much um, personally, but also to our community, and it also added a dimension to the conversation that then made it bigger than just, oh, the Asian community is, is getting hurt. There was a solidarity that suddenly was being heard in a different way. Um, and that was, to me, the first taste of what the power of a coalition can be. Um, and from there, then Sarah got us together and said, let's, let's meet, let's commit to showing up to a room and talk about sustainability. Um, actually, just have a, a bitch session <laughs> for a while. For a while, it was just crying, and then like everything will be okay, and let's meet again next time. A little less crying, um, and let's let's talk about a, a little bit of a plan, and then let's meet again. And then even a little less crying, more plans. Let's meet again. <laughs> Right? And uh, they're still crying, but <laughs> we've also come up with amazing strategies. And one of those strategies, I think, will lead to the next section, which is um, how do we deal with um, funders and foundations and in order to have um, sustainability as a huge part of the, uh, the theaters of color and the assets that we bring to our communities that we serve and the larger community because of that. So how can we find a real sustainable um, system to be in. Well, I just want you to know, Randy, that my 75-year-old uh, aunt from Singapore attended a protest for the first time in her life with a Miss Saigon. Like she was marching up and down. <laughs> no to Miss Saigon. It was hilarious. Um, yes, I can make an activist of my family yet. <laughs> So, um, and, and then there were so many other incidents as well. I mean, it was like we made a theater, there were uh, other, um, you know, really egregious practices uh, among predominantly white institutions, casting. Um, there was like plays that, you know, we, uh, people objected to. Uh, I remember the year that we had our pilot institute in 2012. Uh, not hardly any um, uh, organization here had a woman playwright or a director who was either a woman or a person of color. And I think there was one play in a large institution that was co-directed by a woman. 
So I mean, this like you know, so, so that was really huge for us. We had we had to we really needed to find an alternative, and we needed to find something that we could and, and uh, that we could just say no to, you know. And then we had to figure out how to say yes to everything else. <laughs> uh, so I'd like to turn this over to the RevC uh, funders and say, how did you create RevC? What was the impetus behind your creating RevC? What, you know, how did you come together? Uh, why these foundations? You know, just to some of these questions. If you're, each of you can answer some of that, that'd be wonderful. <laughs> I think Elena was the first. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, um, RevC started. Uh, Racial Equity Funders Collaborative is an informal uh, gathering of program uh, staff from different foundations, and it started with people who were, you know, just wanting to make a change from within uh, philanthropy um, in the direction of racial equity, um, also, you know, kind of talking and, and analyzing and critiquing racism uh, within philanthropy. Um, and we came together um, because of what was going on in the community, some of the, um, uh, you know, kind of horrible <laughs> incidents that had happened in, in some of the theaters, uh, as well as in other uh, fields. Um, and just wanting to come together to figure out how can we, even in an informal organizing way, start trying to change some stuff, start trying to change our own organizations, um, and how can we be a collective learning community to do this? Um, and so I think we came together about the same time in, uh, as, as TikTok came together. Um, um, more about when we first came together, I think a lot of us in the room were feeling frustrated with um, philanthropy's ability to change in the space of equity. There's a lot of talking and talking and talking for years. Um, and I've personally only been in philanthropy for six years. And so many people in the room were saying that for you know, longer than that. And it's been just about talking. And so we as a group wanted to, to investigate how we could really partner have each other's backs to create change that we wanted to see for our communities, and um, it was a safe. It, we said it would be a safe space, and we cried too, and we still <laughs> cried. I don't think they said this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, Eleanor just said she doesn't think it was safe, but maybe I, I would like you to say more about that. Maybe it wasn't safe from the fact that we were being rebels a little bit in wanting to create change. Um, in you know institutions or organizations that have history of how to do things. So I'll let you look at I'm probably one of the newest ones here and I came in um, while I was in the fellowship and my fellowship was all about um, increasing the number of people of color actually in um, philanthropy. So, um, wanting to have this impact is what I saw in RFC. I saw it was more than just talking about it because you come into spaces and even though you're diversifying the spaces, uh, a lot of the spaces still operate under supremacy. I'm just gonna call it out what it is. And so, um, that's what I see the benefit of RFC is really getting to change some of these systems from within and organize them and do that. And I've been with RFC for about a year, and you know, I've been, I think, lucky to come into the, the safe, safe space, the space that is now feeling pretty safe, you know, to some degree. And, and I think about um, why, why wouldn't we have this space too, together? Every time I, I come to one of the meetings, it just feels absolutely right, needed, critical. Uh, to do all of our work better and to continue to, be, to fight and be supported in fighting, um, not just for ourselves, but for the grantees of the community. Um, so there's a, a quite a, a, a wonderful role just in, in doing that. Um, you know, and I also think about how 
it's been the foundation for so many choices that the Bush Foundation has made uh, just in the last year or so here. And I, I think a couple of them, um, one is, is a choice I made, and one is a choice that, that we made in, a, in developing a grant program. I don't know how deep you want us to go into to that now, but it, it, we have a new program called the uh, Community Creativity Cohort Number Two, and it's exclusively focused on uh, people of color, organizations led by people of color and indigenous organizations, primarily serving those communities and rural communities. And those are the communities that have not been served by philanthropy um, in the right way over the, the past several years. And we actually started digging into the data too at the, at the Bush Foundation, you know, in roughly a, a 40 year period, ending in, in roughly 2015. Uh, the far majority of our support had gone into 12, roughly 12 organizations here in the Twin Cities that were founded led by, directed for, essentially, white folks. And so we thought, well, that's not right. And we had to do something to um, change that. And so we're now doing more kind of programming focused directly on the communities that have not benefited from our philosophy. So it's one thing, and then it, a, a personal thing that I did, which I think my, my foundation was the, uh, the ref seeker just this week, I, I, we talk about trauma, we talk about historical trauma, lateral trauma and such, and um, so just this week we did a brown bag lunch with the staff that I helped organize uh, to help our foundation understand what trauma is, you know, what's the science behind it, what's the history, what are the effects, and, and how our community is learning in new ways how to heal. And I, and I don't know that either of those things would have come into the foundation without the Rep Seeker as someone of a foundation. So I'm just thankful to have that foundation. Thank you so much. This is a way of practicing equity with one mic. <laughs> God forbid if we have about 27 mics here. Oh, yes. Of course. I just wanted to add one thing. Justin was talking about digging deep into the philanthropy and the, the history of where the funding had, been, had gone, and all the foundations came together actually and did some of that work um, to see together, which is also not heard of in philanthropy. You don't really share secrets like that, you know. So it was um, that's another part of the work is really digging in and being transparent. We have a newcomer here, so I just want him to introduce himself and the organization for you're from, just like the line, and why you're part of TikTok. Very quickly. Hi, everybody. I'm sorry. I'm yeah. sorry. This afternoon. Um, uh, my name is Alberto Moutiniano. I'm with Teatro del Pueblo, so it's an honor to be here and uh, you know, participate in some of the, the great event as uh, this one. Um, well, uh, for, for me, it's just the fact that I've grown. Uh, it, it, it's, it's one of the things is that being able to spend four and a half years really analyzing and looking at philanthropy as well as the ecosystem of theaters of color, organizations of color, has allowed me to really um, think more deeply about the issues and how every organization fits in this, in this sort of puzzle. So um, it, it, I can't attest to the fact that, I mean, I can't tell you how, how wonderful it is to really, really dig deep into these questions, and really analyze them, not only from a personal point of view, but also from a broader macro point of view. And understanding and learning every process, from everybody works different, each community or um, each organization uh, has different, set of, uh, of perspectives and how they go about their work. So it's really interesting for me and uh, it's been a, a journey of growth. So. Thank you so much. Um, so I just love to hear the story of how TikTok and RevC came together. Um, and if, you, if a couple of you can talk about that, that'd be great. We needed money. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, we started the we started to meet as a coalition and, and and realized very quickly that we needed resources to do the work that we did and this was work outside of running an organization um, and uh, 
and there were ideas that were coming up, and we wanted to, uh, we, we knew we needed resources. And there weren't any um, specific grants within these organizations for coalitions or anything like that. So we were like, what would what, what we do? We have relationships with these great organizations. There, there isn't a grant application for us. So what we did was we called, we called them up. We called up program officers and said, hey, we're doing this. And it was um, the McKnight Foundation and uh, St. No, not St. Paul. Bush. Bush. No, we're the first. Jerome? No. The <laughs> McKnight? St. Paul. And the St. Paul Foundation. We called them up. Sharon DeMarc and, uh, and, and Vicki Benson from the McKnight and said, hey, we're, we started this coalition. Could there, is there any money that you could possibly send our way so we can consistently meet and we have these ideas? And, uh, and they found money. And we got money. We're like, wow, that was easy. <laughs> Is it is it that easy? What's going on? When, so as we as we um, built up the strategy of, of sustainability and, and engaging with funders, um, and we found out that they they had started the their collaborative, it was a natural. We needed to talk. Um, they were working on on um, equity, and we were working on equity. There was disparities in funding. We could help. They were doing the work within their foundations. Very hard work because it's. It's, it is, it is entrenched, yeah. this system. It is, it goes deep and it's, and a lot of times it's, they're not aware. So it's unconscious and deep, which is very, two dangerous things to have. <laughs> <laughs> um, and how could we support their work? Um, and, and then how can um, they support the work that we have been doing in our communities for 40, over 40 years, 20 years, 20 years, 10 years, and in a way that no other organization has been doing consistently and authentically. Um, so we decided to, they were meeting, we were meeting, and then we had a big meeting together. Um, and that was very, a very exciting, we cried in that one too. <laughs> but we shared a lot. Um, and then the core of it is, is trust, is building trust. That's the core of, of TikTok, was build trust. There were so many assumptions that, that needed to be erased. Um, just because we're people of color, we do things very differently. Our aesthetics are different. We had to learn, we had to trust each other. That was big. And then when we went with RefC, that's what the main part of our, our, our meetings were trust. And we had to like breathe, calm down. We don't have to solve this tomorrow, but if we don't build the foundation of trust, nothing's gonna work. Nothing's gonna work. Um, so, it was a, a kind of a natural coming together because, um, you know, we were focused in a very parallel path, um, and, uh, you know, I think that most foundations are set up so that you don't have relationships with grantees, or there's a, a very prescribed way to have those relationships and um, through REFSI, which was already this renegade um, group, um, there was a way to um, really focus on, on relationship building in a different way. And um, as Randy mentioned, building trust, but also uh, stepping back from our roles in our particular organizations and coming together as people uh, in a room trying to figure this out. Um, and, I, and I think that, you know, we didn't start with like, okay, how can we get the grant in place? Um, we started with how can we change the way things are, how we're doing things, what needs to change? And, and then we have come back around to, okay, now that we have a little more clarity how can we get you money? <laughs> or how can we help help support what you need to do the incredible work? I mean, we're so uh, blessed in this community uh, with these organizations that have been around for decades and that are doing incredible work. Um, and so figuring out how we do that change, work together, uh, it's, it's just really critical. Cool. Just remembering that the first
first year of uh, TikTok, we didn't have any grants. And I also recall when we first met with Rexy, you guys really wanted to give us money, and we said no. <laughs> because we wanted to get to know you, because we, we really wanted, to, we set out to upset the paradigm of what it means to be in a relationship um, as an organization and a funder, because we are trying to change philanthropy. And if we just take the money right off, right off the bat, of course we'll be, okay. Um, <laughs> so, so that was really important, that trying to establish trust. Absolutely, and it's very important for us to say that because, uh, like Al said and Randy echoed that, that we are, I mean, yes, uh, you know, the myth that all people of color have, uh, uh, there is solidarity, which is, as many of us know, it is not true. So, but we have to get to know ourselves first and have to really build coalition. And uh, there's one more step uh, before REFC met, uh, was our boards met. Yeah, yeah, that was a very important, like all our boards came together. Like all the five TikTok organizations, and and then after that, when our individual board meeting, I mean, our board was just beaming. That we should have more board meetings together. You know, they also felt like there is a solidarity among you know the challenges which uh, you know the uh, New Mexico Theatre's board is facing with Penambra's board member, Pantier's board member, and that was an extremely uh, you know uh, uh, empowering. Uh, that after that we met uh, Ref C uh, and and um, and what uh, Rihanna you mentioned that you know because we uh, we were running our own organizations uh, and all our organizations were in a position of growth so we are managing all of that and yet we are meeting so first everybody <coughs> decided that you know why don't we have um, administrative assistance at least to bring us together all the time because we are not doing everything and running this coalition which has almost became an important job. And, and there was a uh, there was an offer from uh, one of the foundations uh, that you know why don't we aid that and um, we really debated that and they said that the moment we say yes then the, there was at least uh, the uh, power dynamic and the, okay we have done we have done the equity work now moving on next so uh, not that they said that but we have our experiences made us feel that so. So we just refused that and, and we wanted to arrive, uh, we did not even know what does that look like? What does equity look like? Mm -hmm. I mean, where we are all here addressing an injustice that happens every day. You know, the history of, I mean, there are people sitting over here who have done media research about how many African American institutions have folded, how many organizations of color have folded and who can sustain. It's not about getting a grant to do a play. Uh, how many of us can sustain ourselves? And, and, and so the first meeting which uh, Randy you <laughs> mentioned, like, it was like, okay, let it out. This is what we fucking feel. Oh, uh, 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 <laughs> and all of us were, uh, are talked from a point of lived experience. And, and there was nothing new among the foundation. These are progressive people, as you can, otherwise they would not be sitting here. And I just want to name, just like the way Sarah Bellamy needs to be named, uh, Vicky Benson has been named, uh, Alita Little, Sarah Roman, um, uh, Eric Takeshita, uh, and, and Propel, Glenn, and Sharon Demar, yes. These are, some, these are people who have really put their jobs on the line uh, for us, and they need to be mentioned. Uh, and, uh, and we arrived at trust, we didn't begin uh, there. I mean, there was a relationship, and once Alita said that, so ultimately, is, is it all about the money? I mean, she was provoking us to engage in a conversation. So, um, a part of me wanted to say yes, no, a part of me said no, uh, that, you know, that if they give us a check, if they suppose give us a check, then is RefC TikTok, uh, you know, our vision, our mission, our desire to find equity over, you know? But they were, we we had very we are when when we first came and met at McKnight, we read our mission statement. Like all five of us read part of the mission statement, and we we must say we were in, embraced very powerful, with powerful listening and strong commitment um, from uh, the RefC crowd. As you want. Just wanted to put something in perspective so you have a better idea of what the four and a half years that we spent together, uh, just at the tip that we started about a year and a half uh, working with uh, our, our partners and foundations. Um, uh, the fact that in the process, 
in the beginning, there had been another initiative about 15 years ago. Um, and the big difference about that is we met, um, uh, I think there were three theaters of color meeting at uh, that time. And we met and we did a couple of uh, small things. But the unique uh, process that we've gone through is the fact that we, even in the beginning, we did not get paid to do this. So we just kept on meeting. And at times it was like, oh, we got so much to do. But the, the thought about what we would be able to do if we joined forces kept us going. Um, and in the process, I mean, we have a track record of things we've done. I mean, we've had three retreats, two summits, um, our boards got to, together. Um, we've had uh, you know, monthly meetings and bi-monthly meetings now for about a year and a half or more with uh, RESPI. And uh, so there has been work and there has been things that we've done to accomplish this. In the process is about, like the Punker and, and Rihanna and Randy have mentioned, um, is the trust level. Yeah. It, that takes time to build, um, and we're continuing to build that. So it's a process, and I think what is, would make this one different than the one that we tried 15 years ago is that process of continuing to build till you get to that threshold that you start trusting each other beyond the point that just, oh yeah, it's a nice theater, yeah, I'm gonna go see your, your show. But there's a different, it's a threshold that you have to meet and, and, and go beyond. And I think it, it's taken time and we're in the process and we're continuing to be in that point. Thank you. So I'd like to open up to questions from this audience if you want to ask. And I'll just pass the mic along to you um, when you want to ask questions. But just before uh, I ask that question, uh, before I pass it on to people so you can start thinking about questions you want to ask uh, these, these wonderful panelists, uh, what does equity mean to you? Like when you're in a room together, you're sitting in a room together, the 10 of you, right? Or maybe 11 or 12 of you. What does, what does it look like? You know, I mean, we talk about practicing equity and practicing equity out there, but what does it look like in practice for you? I can't stress enough what a game changer it was in the room when we took money off the table. Because we are so used to functioning in a way. We say, can you please? And they say, well, can you prove it? And we say, yes, we prove it. We've done this, this, this. And I was like, well, um, okay, show me two more things. They're like, all right, here's one and here's two. Yes. And they say, yes or no, right? And then that bit's, and it's, and it's, if it's yes, then it's like, woo, and screw everyone else. And if it's no, it's trauma. Because you spend all this time and resources, and if you're a small organization, that means it's you doing it. Yeah. Right? You don't have a slew of grant writers. Yeah. It's your time that you're also running an organization, and you're taking out the trash, and you're cleaning yeah. the toilet. Yeah. So we, we have these, we have these relation ways of, of dealing with each other yeah. that is just practice that's a, that that and and these practices we found through um, through data uh, there was a report the Helicon um, report that said that 50 percent of 55. all what 55 thank you Cheryl you can help me out 55 percent of all just funding arts not arts funding, arts funding goes to two percent. And this 2% are, are all organizations over $25 million. No, five. $5 million. <laughs> Thank you. I can't do this alone. Solidarity. <laughs> <laughs> we need each other to tell our story. If I was alone, you'd have all kinds of wrong data. <laughs> so, they, yes, fake news is what I have Um. So that's that's real. Those are real numbers. The, 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 now they, had, they did a study before, and it was 50 um, 50 percent. And they did the study in 2015, and it got worse. So all this EDI work is not is not. So those are those are real numbers. So even though we all the mission is to oh we want arts for everybody. We want to have everyone have access. We want all. And this is all the mission that something's not working. So we have to find a, a different way of doing this, which is big. This is dismantling things. This is a, a third way. 
So what our, one of our biggest challenges is overcoming our own uh, ways of doing it, the way that we're used to doing it, the way the relationship has been set for years, yeah. and really, really consciously shift that. Because when we came together, it was like, we need help. And they're like, how much do you need? And, and then suddenly trauma started. Like, I got sweaty. And that it was, a, it was a meeting, it was a meeting at Pangea. It's like, we, we need, and then they were like, well, tell us how much. And then we're like, I'm like sweaty, and I'm like, what's going on? And I'm like, oh, this is part of our trauma. Suddenly I'm in, I need to find a number. Uh, no. yeah. $20. I don't know. Let me have so, well, How much do you have? Like, we, have we have so many. We have so much money. I'm like, well, for what? I don't know. So that trauma is when we, and so when we took money off the table, and I remember very clearly, it was, we were all in, in having a hard time. We were all, we were, I mean, TikTok had a meeting, and we were all, in, you know, like a year, we have funding gaps, and we have, you know, all these things that we're dealing with, and we were like, we need to take money off the table or nothing's gonna change. Mm -hmm. And everybody was like, are we really wanting to do that? And it's like, at least for now, yeah. at least for now. Yeah. And we're not saying that we don't need money, but let's not talk about money. Let's right. talk about, let's get to know each other, let's get to know what the foundations are doing, and let's get the foundations to know what our real challenges are, and what we've been um, what we've been dealing with, and really get that understanding um, before we can start to strategize to how to make that big change. Yeah. 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 Mm. And, and also, uh, uh, so you're in such peace, we just tremendous. Yes. <laughs> uh, and also, uh, also it was important for the for us to hear from uh, you know like people uh, that people from the Red Sea group over here we know them in various incarnations and artists also uh, I mean, we are lucky to have our program directors or poets who are sculptors who are artists who are uh, uh, nefaltists and um, and various communities but we also wanted to hear and then to hear like truth and reconciliation truth and reconciliation uh, that 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 they are accountable for the construction of this inequity. You know, because it did not happen all of a sudden, it didn't like, you know, drop. Uh, so it, it is step by step construction why people of color have the annual budget that we have and why majority of the, you know, um, first I'll say the name, then the abbreviation because it uh, was a symphony, orchestra, ballet have huge amount of uh, budget, uh, you know, each one of them have huge amount of budget, space, uh, uh, how much ever I tell myself, you know, let's focus on what we are doing, what we are getting, but it has to be talked about in comparison, uh, you know, it's not that we are stuck with what they are getting, but the point is the injustice has to be addressed. And, and uh, we sat there and not that anything new is being spoken even in this room or anything new was spoken to the progressive uh, program director that we had in Revsky, but it needed to be articulated. That just like the way we have constructed consciously inequity, so therefore we will make sure that we deconstruct consciously this done inequity. So, yeah. With that, you know, for being part of this group and, and, and other groups, I think about what am I perpetuating? Um, what is the Bush Foundation perpetuating? What is what am I? What's in my role there? Perpetuating and the inequities, and, and what am I not working to dismantle? Um, and this group again is, is a foundation to that. But I, I, foundations also have many tools. Uh, we have dollars. We have convening power. We have lots of relationships. We have a, a, kind of a, a a view on our region that no one else can have in some ways because of all the grantees, because of all the relationships that we have. So why not utilize those relationships differently um, to actually dismantle the systems, to go beyond the Bush Foundation, to work with other funders, to change philanthropy beyond ourselves. And that's the work that really gets me, me energized here. So it's, it's what more can I do? Not what stopping it, what can I do? What more can I do in my role in philanthropy at the Bush Foundation to, to change this dynamic? And I think uh, I, coming into philanthropy, you sort of put on this role. And it's uh, 
that's what equity is, is losing this rope. I don't know what it is, I'm not used to it. I did the fund development side prior to being this side, and I, automatically I felt, uh, it's like, the heaviness of supremacy. I already felt it because I'm a woman of color, but it just is a, a heaviness, and that's what this equity is about, is constantly being held accountable, yeah. constantly having to reflect and think and not always operate out of urgency. You gotta get that out, but really stopping and really being intentional and then again being held accountable and it's about being shoulder to shoulder. That's what I feel like there's been all, so many times where somebody said pump your brakes. Like we start going and it's like no, pump your brakes. We gotta, we gotta stop and that's what equity is about and that's what I think about this work. Yeah, so where does the money come from? You know, you uh, started working for a foundation and you asked that question and, well, that takes you right to racism, inequity, um, every other form of oppression you can imagine. Um, and all of that is built into and encoded in the guidelines, um, you know, how things are set up to function. Um, so, you know, down to like in a panel process, you know, what are the criteria, uh, what is, you know, some organizations use the idea of artistic excellence and how is that defined? And so, you know, you get down into it and it's like, it's all there. And so for me, equity is about kind of, you know, in, by any means necessary, unraveling, uh, uh, deconstructing, um, changing uh, the practices. Um, you know, at Jerome, uh, we, we're now using a panel process and um, over the last year uh, and going into the next year, 70% um, of the uh, panelists are uh, artists of color or leaders of color. Um, so that is a radical shift. Uh, from the way things have been done in the past. But, um, you know, it's at every level, at every opportunity, um, changing. And um, the suppression of the stories, story is, to me, you know, the most essential, one of the most essential ways of communicating as a human being to another human being. Um, suppression of story has been active uh, for artists of color and communities of color and changing that, um, making, uh, removing the barriers, increasing the assets to get those stories out there is, is what's critical. Um, so equity is such a big thing that I'm holding in my personal life and my professional life right now and all of these people have taught me more about what equity does mean and should mean. And um, just kind of thinking about voice, voice and how everybody should have a voice. Um, and another person who worked with us in the Rexy group is Alex Page, who is doing this amazing work um, called Innocent Technologies. And he's working, he started working with Classroom classrooms and teachers um, to talk about innocence and how, so I'm, I'm, just bear with me, okay? <laughs> um, so innocence is this moment where you feel like you can completely speak your truth and be yourself in front of the people you're talking to. And I think um, there's a lot more to to what I'm trying to say, but I think that is a huge part of what equity is, like really hearing people, really listening, and really just just taking, trying every single second to take down any blinders or barriers that you, you hold. And it's been an incredible journey so far. Uh, <clears throat> equity for me has always involved sharing of information and understanding of how it works for others too. Um, 
you know, true, at least my belief is that there is a wrong a spectrum of equity, you know, and it's not apples to apples all the time. But what's really unique about um, coming together is the fact that we're able to be vulnerable, understanding that we don't know all the answers in, the, in, in our, uh, our, our vision to change the paradigm of how it is, the status quo, uh, to change how philanthropy is, get, you know, it, it works. But one, one of the uniqueness is that we understand with, with love, um, understanding of each other. I've been able to be able to discover what are the challenges for a program officer. We always think about, oh, I'm asking and I want this, but how do we get there? And what they might want to give the money, but they have challenges too. And one of the things about this uh, having to hear all these voices is that for the first time I'm able to sit with somebody right next to and share and we really see their vulnerabilities also about what they want to do, but also how they need my help to change that. Um, so it's not on their court all the time, you know, you go and do it. No, it's how we do it together. And, and that for me has been one of the lessons of equity that I've learned in the process of with it really unique and different is that we sit in a room and we all admit that we don't know all the answers, but we come together to find those answers. And we look at those answers together. And that has been what I can take uh, from this process and when it comes to equity. Great, so if you have any questions, we'd love to open the floor to any of you to ask questions. First one, just could you just tell us the, the um, uh, acronyms of what each one of those means? Mm -hmm. I want to write them down. Twin City Standards of Color Coalition and Rexy is the Racial Equity Funders Collaborative. Yes. So this is more for TikTok members. I'm just wondering, I have a small nonprofit, PLC led called Brown Body Cat, but that shame was fun out there. Anyways, I, we, uh, we were founded about five, well, formally founded about five years ago, and it has been an uphill struggle. I know I'm preaching to the choir, I know everybody understands, but as a small organization, I felt really alone. And, um, I feel like, and I know this is a sense, but I, I wonder if other similarly sized small PLC led organizations, if we are all kind of operating on this um, pseudo, ooh, I don't even know what to call it, pseudo internalized colonial based mentality of, you know, we're competing against one, one another. When I, since the onset, I wanted to, yeah. Since the onset, I have tried and worked and have been really interested in coalition building. How can we work together? So, my question is how does a small nonprofit POC led organization either engage with TikTok, become a member maybe? I, uh, you know, we'd love to engage with Ref C, we'd love to be involved because the, the story that you recounted where you had that meeting and Sarah was there, and I can't remember who else you said was there. Excellent. I, I can only imagine how powerful that must have been. I, I know I probably would have broke up crying and been completely inarticulate. And being able to have those allies in, in those key meetings, those key moments is everything. So, you know, any thoughts? I don't know if any, any thought has been given to that yet, but that's definitely, you know, we'd love to be involved. What's your organization? Brown Body. So we, we combine um, honor dance, theater, social justice practice, and figure skating, and we present artistic work on and off the ice. Are you here in the Twin Cities? Yeah. I want to go. <laughs> um, yes. So this, from the very beginning, all the work within TikTok, and also what we're working with RefC, is to create a model. Yeah, a model that then we would um, have a great report on and be able then to to send that, to to offer to the to different communities as a way of doing things. Mm -hmm. So um, so that's ultimately the goal of, of all of this is we'll work out, we'll do the crying and the fur, you know, and we uh, and then it's also to benefit other communities. 
It's, it's, it, we're doing this work so that we get more work for other artists of color. We, uh, we're doing this work so that other foundations can also um, learn from, from REFC and what they're doing and hopefully make a change in their community. So all of this is to create ripple effects um, that will benefit the whole community. Because um, if that, if we can get people to think, oh, we can, if we invest in this organization led by a Peter Cook, if they can, we can help them thrive, then their reach is actually going to make a huge difference in the community, and then the numbers will start to shift, and then you'll see audiences look differently, and then you'll, 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 things will, or you'll see artists who look different, and, and then by 2042, when we're the global majority is now the majority here in the United States, it'll, it'll, we will have a, a thriving art scene that, that reflects that. So there's, we have events coming up, we have things that we're going to do, you know, small things, but the bigger picture is to be able to, to, to be a model um, for, for everyone else. Well, in 2042, I'll probably be gone. Uh, can you speak into the mic? In 2042, I'll probably be gone. Um, but what about like to other um, uh, theaters of color in the Twin Cities area? Like, are you ever going to open up to, say, include some of us? Yeah. Uh, yes, yes, this is, we don't want to, to we have fought against gated communities, we don't want to become one. Uh, um, <laughs> so, uh, so uh, as like what Randy said, we are, we are putting structures in place. Uh, the answer is yes, our the ultimate dream is to sort of, uh, is just that, to include as many people uh, as possible. And at present, we are putting structures in place. We are putting basic foundations in place uh, so that the, it, it, it is just again, you know, the struggles that uh, Sharon, you have experienced, the struggle that Lou Bellamy has experienced for 40 plus years, the struggle that elders in different communities have experienced. You know, we are standing on the back of their struggles and trying to create this. So that with our structuring and with our organization, with our sustaining, you know, how do we sustain even RevC? How do we sustain TikTok? How do we sustain RevC? And how do we both sustain this vision that, uh, you know, you asked how the, what does equity look like? I mean, sometimes I don't even know what it looks like because I feel like I have to imagine it. You know, that it looks like that we all have our theaters, we all have our real places and I don't want anybody to, anybody, especially if they're white, to tell tell any one of us that, you know, uh, if you have a space, it hangs like an albatross around your day. Fuck that. <laughs> you know, we want our own space. We want our own table. We want our own programming. We want our own money. Just like the way none of the large white institutions have ever been told, if you have a space, you might close down. Because they don't fucking close down. <laughs> they, 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 they have multi-million dollars in their foundation to sustain the next 150 years. You, you know? So what does equity look like? Is that space? Like, we, we, we don't go knocking at doors and constantly being refused to get spaces at a time when we need it. And where we want to say, if we burn safe, but uh, 10 people don't come running down and say, you know, we don't do drugs here. <laughs> <laughs> no, this has also happened. This has happened to our, you know, uh, people whom we respect, we invite from different uh, play countries. And it has happened to us. Uh, you know, so, uh, and then there's cash flow. The, our capacity is increasing. People cannot, large national foundation cannot say that, you know, uh, you know, we cannot give you large funding because of capacity. And yet capacity cannot increase without funding. You know, the thing is that, you know, we are not talking to, uh, you know, uh, theater organizations one-on-one. You know, like every subject at PhD level, postdoc level, and entry level. None of us here are the one-on-one -on -one level. Yeah. Uh, you know, but sometimes the conversations of the foundation need to also shift, you know, and are shifting. And because we, our ultimate goal is to shift philanthropy and where we have to sustain ourselves. How do we sustain ourselves? 
uh, they can. Okay, any of these large institutions, which have 5 million or more, they can definitely answer the question, will you be around for the next 10 years? But how many of us can say that? You know, we have to depend on the graces of large foundations. And so, the, uh, so that's what equity to me looks like, where, you know, we can sustain. And another thing that happens is that we train, we train, uh, you know, uh, people without any, uh, not, not with much experience, you know, and, and, and we train them to write grants, you know, and we support them with our economic possibility, uh, with no, no free work. But then what happens is that these large institutions come and just, you know, offer them salaries, uh, you know, and just harvest, you know, the, the, the talent, the craft that we are growing. And I don't blame the people, of course, you know, you get a, you know, $60,000 entry level job, you know, with, uh, with health insurance, I don't blame them at all. But I'm saying this, we are constantly in the supply chain of creating people which large organizations harvest. And so what will equity look like? Our people of color who get trained by us, stay with us and grow with us and grow as our organization. That's what equity to me looks like. Thank you so much uh, for what you're doing. It's really inspiring to me. Uh, and I just to see the cooperation between organizations of color and foundations is really an amazing thing. I've run an organization in Los Angeles for 40 years, and uh, I wish I, it was, you know, I could get in the game in that same way. But in Los, at what you've done here, and I'm wondering, because is it because, is this working because it's a smaller city than Los Angeles? We feel so overwhelmed. We are so small and overwhelmed. And I know that, I, I just, I hope that what you're doing can be, the waves of what you're doing and what you're learning can come in our direction. Uh, but this is a weird country and I feel sort of like California is like in another, uh, is another country in a way. Uh, but I know the same thing exists for us, except worse, uh, where we live. Because we can't even look at the funders like this. We can't have lunch with them, you know what I mean? And, and the people who are thinking like you get fired from their jobs in the foundations. Because I, this just happened to a friend of mine. So, um, how, how do you see this going forward in Albert? No. <laughs> <laughs> I want to take that. And, and this, I mean, the thing is that this is really hard work. I mean, Karen was just reminding me that this, this uh, oh, Vicky was just reminding me that this is really hard work. There are foundations here who are actually willing to sit down and do the work. And that's amazing. Yeah. So, and, and, and really, like, and, and I think the question of how, how we spread this work to other organizations in the Twin Cities, perhaps we haven't yet immediate, got immediate answers for that, but we have to figure that out. Um, one of the things that this goes to Sharon's question and, and yours and your thing, ultimately, we have to have something that works. People are risking their jobs here, yeah. also, from the foundations. But let's not be tempted about that. It's right. reality. But the, what is unique is that they're committed and there's support from TikTok, and they support us, and then that elevates the, the you know, the, the motivation. Um, collaborative work is very important. Right? In order to create something that works, we have to look at all the kinks. We're in the inception still. We need to create case, uh, um, cases, case studies, case studies, things that really changed the paradigm and of philanthropy that a philanthropy and then maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but you need data, you need something to, to take to your trustees and say, look, this is what works. This is a, a, a case study. 
Um, so we're very deliberate in how we go about this. Uh, so that's why this core has stuck together. Ultimately, we want other, or other places in, in, the, in the country to, to work this way. But we, in, at this moment, in this time, what we're trying to do is really make sure we get to those successes. Because if we don't uh, construct that roadmap that is success, we can just share it. Yeah, go ahead, do it. And you'll find the same walls. But we need to you know, destroy those walls, bring them down. And we need to do it together in a way that's very deliberate. So it's not, you know, everybody goes into one room and try to figure it out. We have to have strategy. And strategy comes with uh, time, thinking process, um, uh, and resources, um, which is very, very important. And this, this cohort here, collaboration between us, has allowed to do that because we both have motivations and we try to look for that common denominator to be able to do that. But yes, I'm hoping that in LA, New York, but not only there, but in Kansas City, um, Florida, uh, smaller towns also get to be able to do this. So um, that's the hope. We assure you that's what we're trying to do. Uh, I, would love to, I would love to uh, ask the funders to answer the those questions of whether it is a smaller town, is that why we're able to do this? What is it about your particular, I, I feel it's so personal to it, it's people. You know, ultimately, and so um, I'm just going to have one of the funders try to answer that question in the end. Perhaps try to answer the question of what what is it that makes the, the, the work that you all are doing, and then hand it over to Karen. I think that my answer is that we have relationships, so we'll bond together with those people in your communities, whether it be a big or small town and the people that you trust already build those relationships up. I mean, that's what got us in the room, the relationships that we already had, and that we knew that we could find more and more support within that, this team coalition as we grew together. So that's my, sh we're gonna keep passing. Um, you know, I think, I'm not, I can't answer the question of whether it, you know, I, I agree with you that it's very different, uh, you know, depending on where you are. Minnesota has a really large um, philanthropic community. Um, some places have, you know, uh, I know a lot of folks in the South, but the, the philanthropy communities are very small and it's very different. Um, so there is that uh, difference going on, but nationally, um, you know, I think all of us uh, here are involved in trying to leverage and, um, you know, do this work on a national level, not just on a, a regional level. And um, I have to duck out. I'm, I'm really honored to be here. Thank you all for inviting me. Thank you so much, Eleanor. Really appreciate you being here. Thank you. Um, Karen, you have something to say? I have a question. Excuse me. For TikTok and for um, Repsi, Repsi, did you have discussions about shared values? Um, doing that work first? What are the values that we share? What are the principles that we share? And how, and, and how did those discussions come up? I just sort of thinking about a lot of things that we have in common is um, I, I feel like um, for the five theaters of color that each of us has a specific definition of what success is and what is valuable to us. And I, I can't say with every organization I've ever worked with um, that folks have to have defined that for themselves. Um, but but I, I just will say that that's something I really appreciate and see with these five theaters, is that we have this idea of success and value that is completely not centered in the mainstream at all. And 
it feels to me that that's uh, a really important organizing principle for how we're able to maintain and respect uh, where each other is coming from. Um, I think each of us sees the integrity that um, we're, we're working from, um, how each of us is just intricately uh, defining our success by our, 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 our being in touch and our, in relationship with our community. And, and it feels to me that that's the biggest value of all. I, I think another thing is that nobody has ever left. We have had some stuff come up. You know, really difficult things, but nobody left because we saw that the bigger um, purpose was was so important, and we worked through a lot of things. And um, so I don't know. I just I just feel like you know. I mean, we. I would love to duplicate. You know. And, this, but but it, I think a lot of, a lot of times that when groups come together, there there is just something about um, that underlying I don't know principle that's in common, and I think we're very lucky to have that. And I almost wonder if the Twin Cities sort of helps to foster that kind of um, uh, I don't know that kind of an artist um, because there's so many artists like that here. Which you know, and so many political movements have started here, and and all of those things have just been their success has been linked to is it successful for your community? And I know that that's in the native community how we define things because we got nothing to lose in the native community. We really <laughs> lost everything, so um, so we're not we're not trying to be successful in a mainstream way. We're defining what um, what is successful for us and our. And our our people uh, as a group. I will say for, um, you said no one left, and I think we are continually doing shared values and some foundations have left when I left. Like, I think that that has been a, a thing too. The relationship is constantly redefining that and holding each other accountable, and if you're not in it, then okay, you know, and, um, that's about having trust, but it's also too about us having um, shared and having one another's backs, feeling that way. And when I say one another, I mean it's, it's foundations. I think it's, it's not just us in the room, but it's really like sort of figuring out what do our foundations say that we do and we don't do, and all of us are kind of like, you say you do this, now we want to hold you accountable to this sort of live into that. And I think that that's sort of how all of us are there is constantly Reevaluating if we are indeed doing that. Thank you. I know on a national level, GIA has been doing a lot of work around this issue, and I'm wondering if, as you attend GIA meetings, if you are seeing more of this. I mean, Dallas is up for Dallas, and Dallas is doing a lot of lip service. Uh, to the idea of cultural equity and, and, and DEI, but we haven't quite gotten to the, 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 the point of what you're doing um, as far as actually having substantive relationships with the artists of color. Of course, we probably got more in terms of the, the, the size and the number, but um, I'm just curious to know from a national scale whether or not you're seeing the, the initiatives at GIA has been engaged in really, really beginning to take hold in other communities. Because, you know, Minnesota has always been real radical, so. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have no foundations want to take that? Anyone want to launch GIA? So, part of our um, togetherness and our time sharing as Refsi and TikTok, TikTok and Refsi together, um, we did, talking about modeling um, and being sharing this information more broadly and nationally, we are going to, together, go to Grant Makers and the Arts, GIA, this year, and we are, host, we are doing a panel together to talk about the learnings and um, how we've, create, we've started to create this third way <laughs> of being, um, breaking down barriers and finding new ways to have a relationship with one another. I definitely 
already seen the, the national and kind of the GIA narrative change over time. You know, it's kind of like you do the DEI work within your organization, um, your grant dollars differently. And, and, I, and I don't think it's quite to, you know, deconstructing white supremacy within your organization, but I think it's getting close, and I think that, that we can help, you know, push that along. And it, it, does, it does feel great to be an alluding group of people in, in doing that work, and we really think that's, that's part of our, our goal, is to affect other funders, whether it's locally. Um, and, and I think it's, it's, it's foundations, it's also individual donors. Um, individual donors kind of fall in the herd sometimes to their affiliate organizations. And so there's a lot of work to do, and I'm hoping that the GIA can you know, focus on grant making and just this, this idea of giving differently, this idea of giving equitably, and, and help kind of provide the, the thinking, the resources, the drive um, for people to operate differently. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> all those, all those things that you said, absolutely. We have, we have very uh, specific, strategic um, plans and um, and implementation implementation plans that need resources to be able to be done well. So, um, so all all that 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 you said, we did talk. We do talk a lot about values because. What we found is when we are talking about each other's values, we realize that the foundations have similar values than the theaters do. They, the philanthropy side, want to serve the community. At one point, we, they were the big, the, to, to, to our theaters, they were the big foundations that we couldn't talk to, that they were up here. Because that was the, that was the relationship, even with great, um, program officers, it still felt like they're the big, big, and we're just the little people here. Yeah. And that's what, and when you're talking about LA, that's what it's, that's how it started. But when you hear about these foundations' mission, you're like, oh, you want to serve everybody. <laughs> that's what you say. You want to serve, you want to serve the whole city, right? And then you say, well, what are your numbers? Who are you allocating your, your, oh, only these organizations. Wow, well you're not serving your mission. If you were to apply for your own grant, you wouldn't get it. <laughs> so let me help you. <laughs> accomplish your mission. Because we know how to do that. We know how to engage with our community. We've been doing it for 25 years, 42 years, 20 years, 10 years, 11 years, forever. We know how to do that. We have expertise in engaging marginalized communities. So let us help you accomplish your mission because that's what they want to do. There's just all these other crazy systems that have been set up, criteria, all these things, 
to keep the money somewhere and they have it's like friends of people on boards who are also on the boards and the, but there's this whole system that needs to get broken down that is, is a challenge to accomplishing what they say in their mission. So once we figure it out, oh, that's your mission. You want to do the same thing that, we're, that we want to do. What's making it so difficult? Why can't, why is there still this dis disparities? It's a fact there's disparities. So once we get to that answer, that's when it starts getting juicy and really interesting. And we just have 10 minutes left, so I'll be quick. Thank you. I, I want to actually reframe my question. Um, I think it's more about how, so a couple of things. Um, what I've encountered being young, or being young and small um, is that a lot of the bigger foundations, they, they know about the numbers, they know about the Pangeas, they know about the theater movies, but there's like a block when it, it seems like they're, it seems like smaller PLC-led organizations are invisibilized. And, um, and so even if we do meet the criteria of whatever grant program or whatever, um, we're within the character limits, we're not only explaining our programming and how we need it, but we're also having to, you know, scream, hey, we're here, we exist, and we've been doing this work since 2000, whatever, or whenever. Um, so I just wanted to put that in space. Um, secondly, how then can a small nonprofit, PLC led nonprofit, support or help the work that TikTok is doing? Um, and, and that is kind of a two sided thing because I think um, small entities such as my, my own, our voices need to be added into the fray as well. Yes. Um, and I don't know if I should call it fray, but into the mix. Um, and um, yeah, and, and I realize time, resources, everything, it's limited. And so instead of being one more thing that the members of TikTok have to think about or consider, how can we support the work that is being done? Thank you. Who would like to answer that? <laughs> no, I couldn't deny you in the kitchen with your eyes. I felt like it was an interesting question for yeah, the foundation. Yeah, foundation also can answer. No, uh, uh, you, you don't have to wait one day, some day for TikTok to, uh, to speak for your politics. We are already speaking for your politics. Uh, and and uh, I've always objected to us introducing ourselves as a small organization. We are all big organizations, all of us, right? We have huge visions. You know, we might have less resources. You know, uh, because uh, you know the, these binaries which the English language tells us, and which becomes a part of the DNA of NEA and things like that. You know, in the policy session, there's a particular, uh, you know, there's this, uh, where we quote Marx, we said, "Do they serve marginalized communities?" and my question always to these large institutions is that why the hell should we have marginalized communities? Why can't we all be on center stage? You know, then let us think, have you ever thought about should the opera get money? Is opera marginal? No, why? There's very clear answers. So yes, uh, we are not, you're not going to wait one day to be included. You're already included. You know, uh, because when we are talking about uh, organizations of color, these are five people who have come together and are trying to put our you know, centering our conversation, not just for ourselves. Uh, uh, I, I just want to assure uh, you of that, that at present, like all of us have articulated, we want to create strategic, specific, step-by-step -step process, so that whether, you know, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, I don't think we all will be necessarily around the table, but, but processes of how do we arrive, how do we engage, will be put in place. Uh, yeah. Yeah, from the, the, the funders' perspective, uh, you know, we have a C program that I mentioned before called the Community Creativity Cohort 2. Uh, we have a little bit, so that's up to 40 organizations, roughly half of which are uh, founded by, led by uh, people of color and indigenous communities, currently serving those communities. Uh, and then about half of those are half are rural as well, and some will be both, of course. Um, and, and 
And so the, you know, it's up to 40 organizations approximately selected for this, this program. Uh, a little bit of general operating support going to those organizations, and then a pool of resources that they will get to determine what they do with, um, essentially. And you know, I was talking to Eric Takashita, our community activity director, last night on, on the way home, and you know, we started talking about well, what if we continue to flip this so that eventually uh, the Bush Foundation is applying to work with these organizations out in the community, and that, that you know. You all can kind of think about each other and your own growth and your own durability and, and thriving and you know, what, if it, what if it was like that? But it wasn't. You know, we would love to be program officers. <laughs> <of that. laughs> so just to that, that question, you know, we're thinking about the who's on the radar, right? We we can't possibly know everything on the radar, but those who are in that field can, and if they can start to think about you know, directing some of that funding in the best possible way, that helps all of us. <laughs> This is goes directly to your question, and, and the lady in the back who had asked the question about what are the things that can happen um, at a uh, micro level. Um, first, we've been having summits with independent artists, with uh, activists, and we are looking at creating that round 12 of, of support that we are listening and we're having these listening. I mean, it takes time to organize these summits, but be, be assured that we're not gonna be doing this in a vacuum. We have in our plans, and gradually we're implementing these, um, hopefully regionally, but at a, uh, maybe at a different level nationally, and we will include voices, because we it's important that to assume that we know what all of it. Yes, your voice is important, and please, be assured that we are trying to listen. It's just, we have to do it very systematic and, and, and deliberate, um, and that takes time. The other thing that I wanted to uh, address is visibility, yes. My theater is a small theater. We've been around for about 27 years. Um, 26 officially and 27, 28 unofficially. But visibility has been a challenge for us. Um, but one of the things that I've encountered, and I just talked personally, is that when you look at co collaborating, and I know Pangea and us have collaborated for many years, um, 10, 12 years now, um, and then TikTok, you know, four or five, and we're looking at 10 years um, committed to, but the thing is that when you collaborate, you have to be very specific on what are the bottom lines of each collaborator, because it has to come around that each one of you is gonna feel important at a certain point. It's called like balanced equity. It can't be equitable and everybody's gonna be on top all the time, but it's how you distribute that equity. That means that you know the other person is gonna be important, and there'll be times when they're more important than what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are collaborations, there was one in Michigan, and they hired a, um, a, a grant writer, right? There were like three or four, I think like four or five organizations. And after a year or two, each one felt slighted because they have not talked about what was important that, okay, we're gonna write a grant for you and we're gonna be there for you and that's gonna be your grant and we're gonna support you. But then it has to come back. And then through time, they have not planned that. So one of the things that I'm saying is that it, it, small institutions can gain from other institutions by collaborating but looking at what's important because it takes time and effort. And you have to see what's the give and take of any relationship. So uh, I hope that answers a little bit of what, what you were asking. We have two minutes left, so. Um, I, I also just want to say, we are not anybody's savior. Please do not put us on any sort of a pedestal. Yeah. This is just something that we did as people who are looking into each other's eyes. Yeah. And sure. do not undervalue what you are doing and the expertise you have. You are an expert at the work you're doing. I've never heard that before. But every every single one of you has a life of lived experience and expertise that you have. And if you hold that in your power, you can do as much as, as we've done as five people. And I think what I know is in common here is that we all knew we were powerful 
and it was just time to let everyone else know. We, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, we still struggle with things. You know, um, New Native Theater's last play, Native Woman the Musical, was probably the most important, most proud thing I've ever produced. We didn't get one review. Yeah. We didn't get any press on it. Yes. So, um, sure. and we even performed it at Park Square. So, um, so you know, so it's it's still a struggle, you know. But um, so, anyways, that's what I just want to say. It, it's up to you to empower yourself too, and we're helping. We're helping, but we we're, we all need to not give our power. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so I just want to thank all of you for being here, and I want to thank our live audience as well. Thank you.